deal. It's a big deal for everybody. Congratulations. Go ahead and take the day off. Yeah, it was, he walked in, he was like, oh, there's Gushers. I don't know where they went. Someone took them. Man, when you found out they're halal, then people just ate them. And they're gone. So he was like, oh, there's Gushers there. And I was like, I wonder if they're halal. And he was like, man, why do you have to ask that? <laughs> so then I went to the website, looked up the ingredients. They look, they look good. Okay. Bismillah, walhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salam wa ala rasulillah wa ala alihi wa ashabihi ajma'in. Alrighty. So we are, uh, we're about halfway through, a little bit more than halfway through. The 18th advice. What's the topic that we've been talking about the last two sessions? Or yeah, yeah. So the, the how important it is to have a mentor or a teacher or somebody that you can go to when you have questions. That's number one. Um, and then he mentions some of the qualities that you should look for in a teacher, which we talked about. Um, and now today, he's going to talk about. Um, how, how do you have a good relationship with a teacher? Or how do you have a relationship with someone that you admire, someone that you need as that mentor in your life, right? Um, and this is something that's kind of very different in a lot of ways than what we're used to, okay? So for example, you know, you guys are, are in college. So when you take college courses, a lot of times the, the understanding of like your professor or your teacher who is teaching a class is that you know you have a certain amount of respect for them and that kind of relationship, but at the end of the day, um, you know, rate my professor is a thing. You guys ever seen rate my professor? Yeah. So, you know, there's like a there's like an open open source like anonymous way to critique and rate uh, your professor as far as you know their ability to teach and all that. And that really, when you look at it from the perspective of Islamic education is something that would be maybe missing uh, some, some etiquette, some manners, right? And he'll explain why. But basically, when you enter into a relationship with somebody in a mentor, mentee kind of role, when you're seeking advice from somebody, it's not the same as buying bread at the store. It's not the same as buying clothes, right? When you purchase something at the store, you're giving them your money and you're expecting a product in return. So in that way, we have this whole entire world called customer service, right? Let me speak to your manager, like that kind of stuff, right? When it comes to a relationship to develop your, your iman and your faith, the idea that, you know, we're in like this transactional kind of relationship with somebody that I'm asking for advice from is something that is, uh, is really dangerous, right? And I know I'm being a little bit vague right now, but let's go ahead and start reading the text and you guys will probably better understand than what I'm saying. So Imam Ghazali continues and he talks about how when you see this person, obviously there's nobody that's perfect after the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So when we're talking about perfection, you're not going to find that. But he says what you should be able to find are these characteristics that you admire. All right. So what are some characteristics he mentions? He mentions number one that this person should be a person of patience. They should not be somebody who gets easily agitated. They should be somebody that inspires you to be patient, actually. So when you're getting impatient and you're with somebody, right, the mentor, the sheikh, the ustada, whoever, whether it's Ustada Fatima or, you know, Safi or any of these people, then they, their presence or their advice or their outlook on a situation should be something that inspires you to have patience and perseverance. He also mentions that they should be dedicated to prayer, which we talked about last time. You know, the ability to be stopped wherever you are and pray. It's something that we take for granted. But then when you're with certain people and certain level of faith, they never, ever try to, uh, you know, negotiate their salah, their prayer. They always, always put that first. Uh, gratitude, reliance upon Allah, generosity, contentment, tranquility of the soul humility and knowledge, truthfulness. So he mentions all these characteristics. Why do you think these are so important to have in a teacher? He mentions like basically these eight or nine beautiful characteristics and qualities. Why are they so important to have in somebody? Kind of mimic what you're around. Interesting. What do you mean by that? So like the saying goes something about like you are what you eat. Are. Oh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. You, okay, so like 
you know, a person is kind of the, the sum of, you know, the top, what, five people that they spend their time with. Something okay. Like so it's interesting, right? Because do you guys know that it's good to be generous? Yes or no? Yes. Yeah. Is it good to be patient? Is it good to pray? All the characteristics that we mentioned, is it good to have those things? But do you always have them? When do you lose your patience? Things get rough. Huh? When you're driving in Dallas, right? When things are getting when things are getting rough, when things aren't going the way you expect, right? When 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 you're not being heard, when no one's when the person that you're trying to, you know, is not listening, you start to lose your patience, right? Gratitude. We know we should be grateful, but when do we start losing gratitude? Start losing it maybe when we see others that have things that we don't, right? Or we start to see things that we want and we forget what we already have. We know that we should pray, but when do we start losing our salah? When we're occupied with something else. So all of these characteristics, like in theory, we know them. You know, you could probably sit here right now, read this book and talk about why it's important to have, you know, this characteristic, this characteristic. So if you already know it, then why do you have to spend time with somebody who demonstrates it? Well, because knowing it is not enough. Seeing it is when you can do it. You know, the Prophet Sallallahu his life is preserved and you can read about it all you want. But you have never understood generosity until you've seen generosity. You never understood patience until you've witnessed it. You never understood commitment and tawakkul until you've looked at somebody that has no reason to have good hopes and they still hold on. Right. You've given up. You're like, I don't think this is going to work out. And the person says, don't worry, trust in Allah, it's going to happen. And you're like, there's no way. And somehow, some way, whether it's, you know, 30 minutes or 30 days or whatever later, they have, they hold out hope and Allah Ta'ala delivers. So when you see these things demonstrated, when they're modeled for you, it is a very different experience than when you read about it in the book. Have you guys ever seen a good quality demonstrated for you? What impact did it have? Share a story. When you saw one of these qualities demonstrated, like right before your eyes, tell me about it. Tell us about it. I guess one experience is like sometimes there are people who are quote unquote don't seem to be all that good, just in the general sense. Mm -hmm. and they do the most like heartwarming thing ever. I'm like, wow, it's just amazing to see. And it's kind of like goes to show that like that's why you can always think the best of others okay very good what else anybody else you have like yeah mm. yes you so you've been in scenarios where you've been boiling inside super angry but somehow the person next to you who should be angry is not. And you just look at them and you're like, why aren't you angry? And they're like, doesn't matter. Yeah. Right. Anyone else? Anyone witnessed like amazing generosity or been like a recipient of it? You guys need better friends. <laughs> yeah. Um, we were in like Chicago the whole time. We like Chicago Sharif, please. Chicago Sharif. Fourth holiest city in the world. Not like Medina, Jerusalem, Chicago. Okay, go ahead. That's where I'm from if you can't tell. And then there was like a, we gave us like a homeless guy some money. Okay. And then, well, we had nothing else to do, I'll be honest. So we just kind of watched the homeless guy. Um, guy who, <laughs> person who is homeless. Person yeah, who is homeless. Yeah, yeah. Person who is homeless. Yeah. Yeah. Right? yeah. And then um, he, we saw that he went around and actually gave to other people. Wow. Like they broke it up into pieces. Subhanallah. Yeah. Someone who doesn't have anything, you give them something and they take whatever little thing you gave them and they distribute it. Yeah. And meanwhile, we're like, I don't like this. I want something different, right? So you have these moments, subhanAllah, where you discover inspiration. And again, this is why Imam Ghazali is saying this. Saying you can learn about all the virtues you want, but if you don't spend time with the virtuous people, you won't know what it looks like. You won't be able to identify it, right? And so it's almost like witness, it's almost like going to see the pyramids versus looking at pictures of them or, or, or being in front of the Eiffel Tower instead of seeing it in a magazine or the Grand Canyon. like. You can't describe those things 
in the same way that a, a person's eyes can experience them, their heart can experience them. So when you're around people like he, that's why he's saying you have to be around teachers is because you'll be able to see this kind of generosity that you've never seen before. And you'll be able to experience the humility that you've, you know, I, I'll never forget, man, Sheikh Abdel Nasser, you know, uh, we, we went to, um, we went, we traveled together to California and Sheikh Abdel Nasser is obviously like relatively well known, mashallah, you know, nationally, internationally. Like I've been with Sheikh Abdel Nasser in Medina and Mecca and like people have known him there. They're like, are you Jangda? Are you Sheikh Jangda? He's like, uh, yeah, you know, he obviously doesn't like whatever, but people recognize him all over the world. And then we go to this this event in California where he is the main speaker. He's the guest speaker. He's the one they invited in, right? And he goes to the front table and they're like, sir, where's your name tag? And he's like, oh, I'm sorry, I just arrived here. And he's like not, he's refusing to say what he's there for because obviously he doesn't want to come across as like that guy, right? So he's like, oh, I'm sorry. Like, uh, where do I sign in? They're like, where's your ticket? And he's like, oh, I'm sorry, I don't, I don't, um, I don't have my ticket. And they're like, okay, well, you need to go buy a ticket. And I've actually been at an event where in that moment, he actually walked over and did purchase a ticket. There's no reason for why would he, he's there for the, for the fundraiser. Then, they, then the, the, the director or whoever, the manager of the fundraiser comes out, they're like, oh my God, Sheikh, I'm so sorry. And the person there is like, what? Why didn't you just tell me? And Sheikh's like, don't worry about it. It's just donation now at this point. The ticket was $100, whatever, like just donation. That level of humility. And I'm sitting there and I'm like pulling up his Instagram, like about to like, <laughs> You know, trying to tell the person like the, the fly. Oh, yes. Subhanallah. The flyer had his face on it. And the guy is standing there and the poster is on the table. And I'm like, can you just walk around here for a second real quick? I want to show you something. But but again, and just like you said, right? And that's what I was like, for me, I'm like, what on earth are you doing? But then Sheikh is like, it's not. Don't worry about it. Right. You could read about humility all you want. But until you see that story, you're unable to understand what it looks like. You know what I mean? I could tell you what pizza is, but. If you tasted it, you know what it is, right? Deep dish, fourth holy city. Okay, never forget. All right. So he says that you need to spend your time with people of prayer, of gratitude, of tawakkul, of conviction, of generosity. And the other thing that I'll say here is, is not every person, not everyone who has these is like a scholar. Okay. There are many people who have these traits. You'll find this in your parents. You'll see this in your grandparents and your uncles and aunts. You'll see these traits in some of your friends. So you don't need to be, right? There's different kinds of role models that you can have in your life. How about that, right? You can have the Islamic scholar for sure, but you should also be able to find good, good company in people your own age that can help. And, you know, you see somebody, one of your friends, who's always willing to pay for other people's meals. That's generosity right there. You should be able to learn from that. Right. You should be able to look at one of your other friends that doesn't that doesn't backbite no matter what. And you should be able to learn from that. Right. The heart that's looking for lessons will find them everywhere. But the heart that is no longer interested in learning will not find them, even if they're in the most like. The, the most filled treasure chest. I mean, there were there were hypocrites who lived in Medina. Like, what else do you need? You know what I mean? There's people who didn't believe in Islam who were with the Prophet Sallallahu all the way through. They witnessed all of his miracles. So the hearts that are closed, they, they won't see that stuff. But the hearts that are open will be able to look and see, you know, uh, um, even, even an animal, how it takes care of its young, right? A mother cat taking care of its kittens, and they'll be able to learn mercy in that moment, right? So the heart is really what he's talking about here. He says that if you find somebody scholar, sheikh, mentor, murabi, whatever, whatever you want to identify them as. He says that, and that person has these traits, then you know that you found a light from the lights of the Prophet ﷺ. Okay. Why? Because we believe that these traits, ultimately they go back, 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 all the way to the Prophet ﷺ. So everything that you're learning in Islam is not invented by the person you're hearing it from. Very important. And a teacher should never, ever allow anybody to think that they are the source of whatever they're saying. You guys know, and this is why I'm just reading a book to you. This is literally like story time. It's like advanced story time. This is like Blue's Clues. I'm just literally just reading a book to you because I want you to know that I'm not making, I, this is not coming from me, right? So Imam al-Ghazali here is telling us that 
if you find something good in people that you can take from, then know that that light they have is actually light that's reflecting from the Prophet Muhammad's light. And you're taking it from, from that line. Okay? And then he mentions that, however, beware that the presence of these people in your life is rarer than red sulfur. I love these contextual <laughs> examples. Uh, it's rarer than seeing a Ferrari. Well, it depends. If you're in South Lake, you might see a few, right? But, you know, it's rarer than seeing whatever. Like, imagine something that's super rare. What's, what's super rare to see? I don't even know anymore. Yeah, there we go. Wow, that's like poetic. All right. Watch out for the top of you. Okay, so, so yeah, like it's, it's rarer than seeing, you know, this, the sun out while it's raining. I don't know. That's very romantic, mashallah. <laughs> so red sulfur. Red sulfur, he's mentioning it because it's something that's very rare and valuable. So what is he saying? If you find somebody that you can look up to, don't ever let them go. Whatever you do, don't ever let them go. If you know somebody in your life that you can take good from, Man, if you let that person go, and it doesn't even have to, I'm not talking about physically, <laughs> but if you let them out of your life, then, then, then you've lost something very valuable, right? It's worse than not investing in Bitcoin 20 years ago. It's worse than that. So he says that if you're fortunate enough to find somebody in this with these qualities, then you should definitely try to keep in touch with them, however you can, okay? And then he says, in order for you to keep in touch with them, you have to have good manners. And now he's going to talk about what those manners look like. Some of this, I'm going to forewarn you, is going to look and sound and feel kind of awkward. Because again, we come from a generation and a society and a world where the customer is always right. Let me speak to your manager. Let me speak to your manager's manager, right? Customer service. I have a friend, our joke with him is that the inconvenience. Whenever he feels like he's been inconvenienced in a in a store, he just tells the manager, "How are you gonna How are you gonna um, compensate me for my inconvenience?" Right? <laughs> I'm not gonna mention his name, but if he's watching, he definitely knows. Uh, he got a he ordered uh, chipotle, and he ordered avocado as like one of his toppings or guac, sorry. And they, and then when he opened it, the avocado pit was in there. Now I'm kind of a foodie, so I'm like, okay, it preserves the green, it preserves the the, the quality and the the color of the of the guac, right? The pit helps preserve that. But he's like, no, that was a major inconvenience. I could have broken my tooth. <laughs> All right, and he works with teeth, so I could have broken my tooth. So he called Chipotle, and he was like, it was a major inconvenience. Dot dot dot. So I think they gave him like three free meals or something. So, so I know who, I know who to call whenever I need I need like you know. Someone to be, you know, <laughs> squeeze. So he says, when you have this respect, he's going to start to describe it now. And again, remember, this is something that when you translate it to like our, 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 our retail, our spiritualized retail world, it's difficult. But think about it. He says that outward respect, you have inward and outward. He says outward respect entails that you should never argue with your teacher. What does this mean? Does it mean that you can never disagree with them or have a discussion? What's the difference between discussion and argue, argument? Emotions. Hmm? Emotions. Uh, maybe, Emotions. yeah. Emotions are definitely a symptom of it. What else? You're not willing to see the other side. Okay, good. Very good. You're unwilling to acknowledge that their side even has any merit. This is why Imam Shafi'i, he said, when I used to enter into a discussion with somebody or a debate, he goes right before the debate. You guys ever seen like a... MMA fight? It's haram. Don't watch it. Anyways, uh, they hit the face. Anyways, but you ever seen, like, what do they do beforehand? They always go to their coach in the corner, right? They go to their trainer, and they talk. They have, like, their pep talk before the fight. I don't know. My friends tell me. It's haram. I don't watch it. So <laughs> I'm joking about the haram part, maybe. But, you know, Imam Shafi used to open his hands before a debate with somebody, and he'd make dua, and he would say, oh, Allah, make the truth appear on their tongue. Okay, that's a really hard thing to do. He's essentially asking Allah to give the person he's debating against to make them the one who's victorious in the debate. Why is it so hard to do that? Ego. Ego. Big, yeah, I mean, you, you basically have to just submit your ego and say, I don't want to win. It's not about me. We're looking for the truth. When you and I are discussing something, we're looking for what's right. It doesn't matter who wins, 
right? And if you, you know, an example of how this is manifest is like, have you guys ever been in an argument with somebody and you've purposely hidden a detail that might give you like a weaker side? Like you hidden it? Why'd you hide it? If I hide a detail, so you know what? So you, so you don't appear to be wrong. You're not actually concerned about actually being wrong. You don't want to appear to be wrong, right? Let's say that someone forgot to pick someone up from the airport. Ever happened to you guys before? Okay. <laughs> I, just, I just struck a chord. Someone, guys, someone just shuddered. Like, yeah. Okay. You forgot to pick up someone from the airport or you forgot to order food or whatever. Like, there's a major issue. It's causing a lot of drama. There's a lot of masala flying everywhere now in the house. Okay. And they're trying to narrow it down. Who did it? Who did it? Who did it? Okay. And you're looking through your text and you're scrolling, scrolling, and all of a sudden you see one thing that could be, you're like, oh, dang. I said AM, not PM or something, you know, like a little slip and you just keep scrolling, right? You're like, okay, I can't, I can't do that. I'm not, and, or you bend it so the screenshot doesn't catch that part because you don't want any incrimination. Now see the nefs has won because now it's no longer about actually solving the problem. Now it's, I don't want to appear guilty. So Imam Shafi, he used to say, oh Allah, make them right. Because this is the, the dua that he felt he had to make so that he was sincere. You know what I mean? So when you have a person in your life that you look up to, there may come a time where you actually do disagree with them sometimes. But what you want is not to win. What you want is for the truth to become manifest. And that turns it from an argument into a discussion. So he's saying never argue. Arguing is I want to win. Discussing is I want to know what's right. You know what I mean? And you're allowed, you're allowed to share and you're allowed to say, I don't understand this. And you're allowed, it all is how you frame it. It's all in how you frame it. Okay. And emotions are possible in those discussions. As long as you always leave the door open for what? I could be wrong. I think I'm right, but I definitely could be wrong. But if a person walks in and says, I know I'm right. And there's no way I could be wrong. Look, what's the point of even talking now? There's no point. Now we're just going to butt heads even more like those rams that just run into each other. And we're going to leave you bruised and me bruised and our relationship is done. Okay, so he says, number one is don't argue with them. And he says, even if you know this is going to be uncomfortable, even if you know that something the sheikh is saying is wrong. Okay, whoa, hold on. Whoa. Everyone's like, what he's saying here is not Islamically wrong because he said earlier that we never do obedience of any creation over the creator. So if the sheikh is saying we pray four times a day, right, you're not like, well, he's my sheikh. <laughs> you know, what he's saying here is what? If the sheikh says, uh, next week in class, we'll be talking about this. And you know, and I know that next week we don't have class because of some reason. Okay. If it's a mistake, that's, 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 um, it's like a mundane mistake, not a spiritual mistake. Spiritual mistake is like making a statement that is spiritually, Islamically, definitively wrong. We're only going to pray three times a day. Like, okay, that's not right. All right, run away quick. But if the person says the plural instead of a singular, right? Uh, we have sandwiches for everybody after class today. And, in, and actually, we have pizza. Don't be that kid. Actually, Sheikh, I don't know if you know, but there's pizza. It's not sandwiches. And some of you are laughing because you know either you were that kid or you've seen that kid, right? Don't be that person. Don't be that person. Some people in classroom environments, they don't ask questions. They try to make points. And that's what he's saying. That's bad adab. You know what I mean? Like a person who basically raises their hand just to kind of like climb up the ladder, get on top of the totem pole. He's like, it's inappropriate. It's not good adab. If your teacher says something and you know, and everyone in the class knows, they're kind of like, oh, what, what he or she meant. You know, Ustada Fatima says, oh man, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's 80 degrees outside. And you're like, actually, this is 90. It's like, don't be that person. You know what I mean? And again, we're all laughing. Inshallah, hopefully it's a good sign. But there are some people that really, they keep score, man. And any chance they get to where they can disprove somebody or, prove, or, or, or conquer someone's mistake, they take any chance they get, they can do that. And what you'll find is that may Allah protect us. If, if that's within me, I'm going to be very lonely eventually. Because we all make mistakes. And this is why, by the way, marriages fail. This is why parent and child relationships fail. This is why friendships fail. No one wants to be around somebody that's constantly looking for them to slip. Nobody wants to be around that. 
if I made a mistake, and I know it's a mistake, and you know it's a mistake, and in the end it's inconsequential, saying Tuesday instead of Wednesday, right? Saying AM instead of PM, and I know what you meant, and you actually know what you meant, there's no reason for me to have to point out that flaw, right? Okay, so that's what he's saying here. And then he says, you should also not spread out your prayer mat except for the time of prayer, which means basically what? If we're sitting in this gathering and Maghrib comes in here, inshallah, 839, that's when Maghrib comes in, 837. We don't pray here because we go to VRC to pray. But if we were, okay, to pray, um, it would be like, don't be that person at 834. You're like, right? I'm in the middle of teaching and like the person lays it out. Allah, right? Does start doing their sunnah. That person who kind of, you know, in the middle of the of the class, in the middle of the presentation or whatever, the person starts to say like, oh, it's time to pray. That person, he says, it's poor, it's poor etiquette. Okay. And then he says, when you complete your prayer, you should also take away your prayer rug as soon as you can so that the class can continue. You guys kind of catch a trend here. What's what, what are you guys catching here when he's talking about these manners that a person should have in their mentor circle or classroom circle? Okay, don't be rude. Yeah. What else? Huh? Yes. Very good. Because you're not only respecting your relationship with the sheikh, you're respecting everybody else's time as well. You know what I mean? Or the question. If you already know the answer to the question, but somebody else doesn't, and you start unfolding your prayer rug and making you know, your tasbih and praying your sunan, you might have actually cut off a portion of what somebody else really needed. You know what I mean? Or likewise, if you want to drop, you know, if you're Hanafi, you want to drop 17 sunan after your salah. I'm Hanafi, so I can say that. It's only Hanafis get it. You want to drop every sunan in the book and, and class needs to keep going after salah. You might actually be cutting into time that someone else needs, right? Now, if you need to pray sunan, what can you do? Pray at home. That's one option. Let's say the class is in the masjid. You just go. Yeah, you can pray after or you just go to the back. Like, it's really not that serious. You know what I mean? But again, the, the common thread that he's addressing here is a person where they have kind of, their ego is showing in everything they do. Oh, you're wrong. Oh, it's time to pray. Oh, I need to, it's not about you. You know what I mean? When you've engaged in this relationship now in a classroom or one-on-one -on -one with a teacher, what you say is, I'll take, I'll take care of my stuff after. You know what I mean? I'll do this later. I'll do this. It's about you, or it's about the class. So it's about ego is last. My ego is last. That's what he's saying here. And he says that um, you should do whatever the, the teacher, as long as you're able to, you should do whatever you can, as long as you're able to, whatever the teacher recommends. Okay? Um, and this is also something that we're not used to. We're just not used to it. You know what I mean? Um, I, you know... <laughs> I'll never forget when I when I first one of my teachers earlier on his name was Sheikh Ihab in Chicago. He was a really awesome guy, man. Subhanallah. So he was a mashallah a scholar. He studied with Sheikh Ibn Thaymin, rahimahullah. Was a very famous scholar from Saudi Arabia when he was alive, and um, he stayed with him for like a long, long time. Then he got his PhD in computer science, and he went and he taught uh, Sheikh Ihab. He taught at DePaul University in Chicago. So he was like really multifaceted, mashallah. He's a scholar. He's also a professor at a university. Um, and he was awesome, man. He was awesome, mashallah. And his, his character was so beautiful, too. He was such an awesome, awesome guy, mashallah. Um, and I remember, like, one of the first times that we sat together, you know, people came and they would ask him questions after salah. So after prayer, you know, fit questions. Man, I was just at Mughar VRC the other day with Shah al and trying to leave after Mughar. We almost had to stay till Isha because the fit questions just came flying. So anyways, so, you know, there's people who come and ask questions. And... Um, you know, they say, this is the situation, you know, can you give me some advice? Can you give me the answer? So Sheikh Ihab would say, he would always start by saying, do you want the real answer or do you want me to tell you what you want to hear? That was his first response. And the person's like, what do you mean? No, of course I want the real answer. And he's like, no. He's like, so what, if I'm going to tell you the real answer, it may not be exactly what you like, but it might be the right answer, right? But if you want to hear something different, just tell me what you want to hear now and I'll tell you whether or not I can tell you that. You know what I mean? Sheikh, is it halal to invest in this? He's like, just it, tell me, do you want me to say yes? 
Because if you want me to, then I'm the wrong person to ask. Because I'm going to give you the answer. You know what I mean? So sometimes when you engage in this relationship and you want people to give you advice, you guys ever asked for advice before? Can you give me advice? Ask yourself before you ask for advice, do you really want advice or do you want someone just to kind of gas you up? There's a big difference. Okay. So he says, whatever your teacher tells you to do, you have to at least try to do it. As long as it's within your ability. And obviously, foregone conclusion, as long as it's not haram. Right. And he mentions this later. He says that you never choose the creation over the creator. So what does that mean? It might mean that you're, you know, you're really upset with somebody. You're really upset with a situation in life. Maybe it's your friends, maybe it's your family. And you go to your mentor, your teacher, your chef, whoever it might be, and you say, Hey, I really think that this is like, you know, my mom or my dad, they're acting like this. And my sister is doing this, and whoever my friends are doing this. And you and you just have your argument lined up perfectly. And then the person says, I think actually you're being a little bit out of line. Excuse me? Right? What do you mean? And this actually happens. I'll tell you, it happens a lot. It happens a lot where people come and they've already decided what they want the answer to be. And then the person says back to them, I actually don't think that that's the case. I think you're missing something. And they say, I thought, whose side are you on? The answer is no one's side. Right? You're just trying to get advice. So it's really, really important to go in there with that objectivity. Um, and then he mentions, he says, these are all outward actions, but these actions all rely on inward. Okay. So if you guys ever apologize to somebody and not meant it, you know, sorry. Well, I'm sorry. Right. That those are, I don't mean it. Have you ever thanked someone and not meant it? Sure. There is a disconnect between outward and inward. You're doing the outward thing. Thank you. I'm sorry. Right. But the inward, you're like, your fault. I really don't care. He says that when it comes to your relationship with your teachers, this is going to be the first thing that breaks it. If you can't be the same person inside as you are outside, you're going to, you know, it's like walking in quicksand. You're not going to make it very far. So what does that mean? It says inwardly, you have to be a person that also respects what they hear and accept from the teacher and not deny it inwardly or outwardly. Otherwise, there's a little bit of hypocrisy there. So what is it? What could be an example of that, Mothoff? Inwardly denying what you hear outwardly. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Inwardly, you're like, this guy has no idea what he's talking about. Exactly. Exactly. Or you even go back, or even worse, you go back home and you're like, well, I talked to the sheikh and they said that I was, yeah. <laughs> they, said that, they said that I was right. And you're like, oh man, subhanAllah, you know? Um, and so it's rough, man. It's rough. You know, it's really difficult. This path is not for everybody, right? Like if you want to be able to have a mentor, somebody in your life, it's not for everybody, you know? And if you've ever given advice to somebody before, let's say that there was somebody, anyone here have a younger sibling and they've asked your advice? You know, you, you kind of know what he's talking about. You kind of can figure it because it's very similar. You know, younger sibling comes up to you. Hey, I'm in this situation. What should I do? You're like, just, just don't do it. Like, why? You're like, just trust me. Just don't do it. They go and do it. You're like, I told you not to. You told me you weren't going to. Why would you do it? Oh, I thought, I, you know, it's not the same. You don't know, right? We love each other. It's like, <laughs> you know. And you're just like, God, man, I told you. I literally got, I, I took this test. I marked C. I got it wrong. I showed you the Scantron. You still mark C. You know what I mean? Like, literally. And, and subhanAllah, you're just like, sometimes that's how I feel when I deal with people who are, who are on, on, on that tip. So anyways, but like we said, like you said, you know, reading that fire is hot will not teach as well as getting burned. And so sometimes you just got to go through that experience. But if you want to, if you want to really, next time that person comes to you, next time that sibling comes to you and asks you for advice, after they did exactly what you told them not to do, what are you going to say? You're like, I don't know if I'm all in right now. I don't know if I have time to listen to you for another hour and then give you my feedback because last time we did all this and nothing came from it, right? So when, when you do kind of go to somebody, whether that person is like a scholar or an imam or your parents or whoever, and you do seek that advice from that counsel from them, sometimes you have to put your ego aside and say, you know what? I don't know if I agree with them, but let me give it a shot. 
Let me give it a try. You know what I mean? And, and ultimately, subhanAllah, what you'll find is that Allah will put barakah in that for you. Because you actually decided to, any time in life you quiet your ego, Allah puts barakah in whatever you're doing. Because your ego is like your enemy, dude. Your ego is like, I'm more important. I'm the one. I'm this. I'm that. Anytime you say no, I'm doing this for Allah's sake alone, barakah just shows up out of nowhere. In the form of wealth, in the form of ease. Allah makes things easy for you. Barakah just appears out of nowhere. Okay? Uh, and then he says, finally, and we'll we'll wrap up here. We'll take some questions. He says that um, you should be very careful not to keep the company of, uh, of of immoral acting people, people who act immorally. And he says because when you are in the company of immoral people. And we're going to define this in a second. Um, he says that your the, the 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 company of moral people does not combine. It's like water and oil doesn't mix. Now this is something that's really interesting. It's something that's actually very important because in another one of his books, Imam Al Ghazali in the Ihya, in one of his chapters called the Rights of Brotherhood and Sisterhood, he actually writes something very different than this statement. He says that you can never, ever uh, cut off somebody from your life. It's not allowed to cut off somebody, no matter what they do, if they're a Muslim. So how do we reconcile these two statements? Don't keep the company of immoral people or people who do immoral things. And the other statement in his other book, which says you can't cut somebody off. Any sisters? Yeah. Okay. Still say salam. I can, can I push back on that? It's really awkward. Like some like salam. How you didn't respond to my text for the last three years? It's like, why go salam? You know, like that's all you can say. Is like, <laughs> well, you know, uh, you know, I, 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 in a theoretical way, sure, sure. Salam doa. See you at the masjid. See you at Jummah. See you at Eid. Salam. And maybe okay to give you. Not to obviously, that's a good answer, but I do think that to some degrees, uh, it, it's 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 difficult it's difficult to to execute that without awkwardness. So how do we make sure? See, now this is this is one of the things the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said when the, one of the companions came to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. My mom sent me this hadith today actually in WhatsApp. My mom still thinks that I can't understand Arabic, so she uh, she sent me hadith in Arabic. She's like, "What does it mean?" And then I translate it for her, and she's like, very good. Right? I'm like, this is Gandalf. Like, what's going on? Like, <laughs> why are you testing me, Professor Dumbledore? So, so there's a hadith she sent me today that's very powerful, which is the hadith that the man came to the Prophet, so he said that, what's the most beloved uh, uh, deed to Allah? And uh, he, the response the Prophet so gave was actually quite comprehensive. It was very long, but the general summary of it was, to uh, to to make your brother or sister happy, you know, to put them in a state of happiness, to decrease their difficulty, to to take care of their debt, to feed them when they're hungry, to walk with them when they're in need, like all these beautiful uh, moments of character. So, how do we preserve that while still making sure that we're not risking our own iman? Because that's where the immorality thing comes in. Anyone else? It's like a puzzle. We'll come back to the guys and say, yeah, that's for good. Okay, don't get too close and make dua for them. Again, it sounds very good on paper, but then what happens if that person like calls you? I can't get too, I can't get too close to you, but I'll make dua for you. Think, okay, let me help you with this, guys. Think about how life actually works. Okay. <laughs> We're getting there. Can be nice to their face, yeah. We're getting much closer. Yeah, like how does life work? How does life work? You choose to spend your time with someone, right? It's a choice that you're actively making. Yes. And so, in what? In where? When? In every regard, right? So there's different scenarios. So, so Friday night, someone. there's an environment that's different than Saturday morning. One more time, sorry. 
Okay, treat them the same way you want to be treated. Very good. Golden rule. Let me ask you a question, okay? If, if, if there are people that are doing something at a time and at a, at a date and time that you personally don't feel comfortable with, does that mean that forever, for the rest of their life and all existence, that's what they're going to be doing? Friday night plans are at a venue that you don't feel comfortable with. Saturday morning, they are going to get coffee or play basketball. Is it haram to join somebody who is doing something previously that is impermissible to join them for a permissible action the next day? Very good. That's how life actually works. And that's how the ummah actually works. You want to hear the greatest proof for this? Who was more, who, okay, after the Prophet Sallallahu does everyone have flaws? Yes. Only perfect person, the Prophet Sallallahu Did he have friends? How do you explain this? If you're not allowed to have, have you guys ever heard growing up in Sunday school, don't be friends with bad people? Okay. How was the Prophet Sallallahu able to put his hands and, and arms around a person named who who was nicknamed Himar. Okay. And he and this person used to have a problem. He used to drink publicly. He used to publicly drink. In the streets of Medina he would be found drunk, unfortunately. Companion, Sahabi. And he would get he would get punished for it. And when one of the companions said, May Allah's curse be upon you, the Prophet looked at him and said, Take that back. Because he loves Allah and his messenger. The Prophet just said that the person who publicly was drinking, intoxicated, loves Allah and his messenger. This sirah, the life of the Prophet that we read, that we study, it does, is not always compatible with some of the things that we may have heard. Right? Because you hear stories about this person, for example, the woman who committed zina comes to the Prophet No one was like, get away, we can't be near, right? There was definitely, no one said what you're doing is okay. No one told Himad, hey, drink, keep drinking, it's fine. The Prophet, of course, would never do that. It's haram. It's this big sin. But when he was sober, it was fine. When he's drinking, it's not okay. Right? So Imam Ghazali here, how do you reconcile these? Is you become a person that your heart, when there's environments that, affect your heart, you stay away from that. But when those same people, maybe because you are like, I don't want to be there at that time, in that environment, with that sort of effect, because my heart does not feel comfortable there. Right? That's fine. That's called taqwa. But then, if that same person says, hey, do you want to meet for coffee tomorrow? You can't be like, well, last night I know you were there. So I'm not going to meet with you tomorrow because that's cutting someone off. And think about your own life. Are there people that are better than you? And they still give you time, don't they? You know what I mean? There's people that would not do some of the things that we would do. And they still give us a smile and give us time. So this idea where community has levels and the levels don't interact, right? There's barely Muslim. You know, <laughs> the barely Muslims, this, 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 pious, you know, students of knowledge, orama, this and that. And it's like, no, no, you can't look down and talk to anybody. That's not from Islam. The Prophet Sallallahu would speak to Abu Bakr, radiallahu an, and Omar, radiallahu an, in the same day that he would talk to people who were really struggling and committed big sins. Right? But he would never compromise his own, of course, heart, faith, whatever you want to say. He would never compromise that, but he would always find people where it was okay to find them and be with them. Okay? So this is how we negotiate this. This is how we negotiate this point. All right? Um, that's what he says next. He says that. He says, know that true spirituality is two characteristics. Being, being steadfast and having good dealings with other people. He says, whoever has steadfastness with Allah, they will have good dealings with their Lord. And whoever has steadfastness with other people, then they will treat them well, no matter what, all the time. And then he said that you should always treat people beautifully and never uh, contradict or go against somebody as long as there is no violation of Islam. Right? It's a very beautiful way to live life. 
If you see something that is violating Islam, step away. You know what I mean? I have a friend, man, subhanAllah. I have a friend that I really admire in this regard, really admire him. Uh, he is very friendly with many different kinds of people, like many different walks of life. You know what I mean? Um, and he's known as the guy who will always pray, no matter what. And he'll be like in the middle of something, and he'll just get up and go pray Malkar. Maybe the people there are not on that tip yet. They don't pray yet. But he doesn't let that stop him. He gets up, takes his prayer rug, goes make wudu and prays. And that heart, to be able to do the right thing no matter who you're around, that is a truly strong heart. Right? Now, we are all creatures of community. We need to be around people that motivate us to do good. But at the same time, it's very... It, it, it's part of it's part and parcel of our faith to be able to make the right decision even when we're alone. We have to be able to do that. Okay. Anyone have any questions on this? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So this is a really good question. Um, different teachers and different imams and you have different personalities. And actually, in another one of his books, uh, in another book to altogether, Imam Zarnuji talks about this, and he says that you have to find the teacher that you kind of jive with. Like, not everyone's going to fit. There's a famous scholar named Al-A'mash. Uh, he, he, he was known for being very uh, sharp-tongued. And people used to bother him a lot, you know, asking questions. And he didn't want to get quite, he didn't want to be asked questions. It was just his personality, right? So there's a story about him that basically uh, he needed a haircut. And he didn't want to get a haircut because the barbers kept asking questions. So he's like, I don't want to get a haircut. So he just kept letting his hair grow. So finally, I think someone convinced him, like, get a haircut. And uh, so he's like, okay, I'll, I'll get a haircut, but only in the condition that the barber doesn't talk to me. Which, by the way, goals. That's exactly what I'm going to lie to. Right? And so he goes, and the barber is like, fine, I won't ask any questions. He's cutting his hair, cutting his hair. And then finally he gets, like, to the halfway point. And he's like, I just have one question. And he says that. And Atmash says, he's like, he gets up and just walks away. Half his hair is cut, half is not cut. Right? It was just a personality, right? Now, would you say that this is necessarily like the most soft, compassionate, merciful personality? No, right? It was clear he was tough. You know what I mean? And the Prophet ﷺ would sit and he would look at Abu Bakr, he'd look at Omar, and he would say how different you two are. Right? He would say one of you reminds me of how, like, of toughness and one of you reminds me of gentleness. You know? They were just different personalities, different types of people. So, it's also important for you to also kind of see who you click with and who you jive with, because maybe, uh, you know, th that relationship, that mentor, that teacher is just not compatible with you and you're not compatible with them. It's like a mutual, it doesn't fit. You know what I mean? It doesn't mean that they're a bad teacher. It doesn't mean you're a bad student. It's just not the right fit. So that being said, there will be moments with your, uh, with people that you look up to, people that you ask questions to, where they will do things that bother you. Uh, it might be that they don't return your calls on time or they don't give you enough time or they answer a question very, you know, abruptly that you thought was going to be. And it's just like anything else. You just kind of have to be like, OK, trust the process. All right. They've been through this before. Say their first rodeo. You know what I mean? Um, and yeah, over time, inshallah, you'll be able to sort of be like, OK, I get it. And again, what you're describing is very honest, which is there are times where you're like, oh, that's not what I wanted to hear or that's not how I was going to hear it. But the reality is that over time, you will also get better at listening and learning, right? So, but I would say very importantly, that first step is very critical. Make sure that the teacher that you spend time with, actually, Imam Zarnuji says you kind of almost have to like do a survey. Like go listen to some classes, go attend some, you know, durus, go, you know, sit with them as much as you can and kind of get a feel for who you like. You know what I mean? So, I'll make it easy. Yeah. Like a lot of the times people are, you know, are put in a position of mentorship when they aren't necessarily like 
you know, crowned it, right? Mm. Um, in the sense where people come to you for advice, or people, you know, naturally gravitate towards an individual in the community or, 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 or a person. What what do you do when you happen to be that mentor and you have a mentee or someone who consistently makes the, the same mistake, right? Or consistently goes against mm. your advice. And you consistently give them the same answers or steps to resolve whatever the issue is. Um, and it doesn't necessarily go anywhere and it's to their detriment. Yeah. It really depends on your relationship with them. But if I, I would say that if somebody was kind of consistently not uh, heeding the advice that you were giving, that maybe that would be a good conversation for you to have. Like, hey, I've noticed something. The last few times that we've talked, you kind of brought up the situation. I give you what I think would it'd be a good good solution, but I noticed that for maybe for one reason or another, you're not taking that solution. Like, is there a reason? Uh, you know, and kind of just not putting on the spot, but kind of being like, let's explore that further. Let's see why that's happening because maybe it's something you don't know. Maybe there's like something out of their control or something, right? But if it is purely just like, ah, I can't do it, then it's like, okay, well, it's good for me to know. Just let me know when you when you want to kind of go approach, you know, if, if, if that thing that you're struggling with, you're not ready yet, let me know when you're ready. Yeah, but always being there is important. Yeah. Good question, anybody else? No, no, yes. Yeah, yeah. Yes, sure. Yeah, you don't have to, you don't have to be best friends with everybody. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, you 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 have a relationship with your fellow Muslim to the degree that is good for you for your faith. So maybe there's some people that you can't have that closeness with them because maybe, like you said, it's it's there's there's a there's a dynamic between the two of you that's not healthy. Right. And um, and that's fine. You know, but maybe it means that, like like you said earlier, it's a salam, it's a dua, it's a text message on Eid. There's that quality of relationship. And then there's those that you can meet once every quarter for lunch. Then there's people you can hang out once a month. And then there's people you can spend, you know, more time with. But really, the ultimate goal is I want to make sure that I'm not cutting anybody off. You know what I mean? Because that I mean, what, what's a community if people feel like they can't be part of it? You know what I mean? So you have to gauge that within yourself. And ultimately, it's not about sort of blaming anybody else, but it's more so saying, like, I think that the, the, the dynamic between us is not good for me. You know what I mean? Yeah. And again, you don't have to, like, disclose that. You don't have to be like, I can't be friends with you because. Of, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but being able to sort of know that internally is very healthy. Yeah. Good question. Yeah, it happens naturally. Yeah, yeah. And some friendships that you have, like, that, you know, for some friendships have expiration dates. You know, like, at some point you're close. All right, I just saw some people, like, feel that. They were like, yeah. All right. Don't look at the person that you, you know, <laughs> awkward. You're like, see? Expired. They do. I mean, they do. And it's healthy and it's normal. You know, just because you were really close to somebody in college doesn't mean you have to be super close. I tell this, you know, college students, Mathop, you probably remember this coffee talk. I asked, like, how many of you are freshmen? Everyone raise their hand. How many friends do you have? They're like, 3,000 friends. I'm like, okay, that's ridiculous. Yeah, exactly. You will have, at the end of at the end of college, you're probably going to have 10% of the friends that you, no, 5% of the friends that you had. And that's fine. That's actually normal. That's good. You know, you should have different levels of friends in your life. Not everyone is the person that you can divulge everything to. You know, not everyone is a person that you can spend tons of hours with. And if that if you naturally grow apart, that's fine. So, yeah, you're right. You know, there are some people that maybe because of just like the choices that you're making, the choices that they're making. And it may not even necessarily be, by the way, halal haram. Sometimes they're like just different choices um, that maybe that's just the closure of your relationship. And it was great. It was a great book. But there, this is the ending. You know. Yeah. OK, let's wrap up, inshallah. So that way we can make it over. Uh, grab some food on the way out, inshallah, and then make it over to the masjid if, if you want to go pray Maghrib, inshallah. Barakallah uh, fikum, everybody. Jazakumullah khairan. We don't have a session next week, uh, inshallah, because of Eid. So, and I have to go to another wedding in Florida. 
that they're asking me to dance at. And I'm like, relax. Okay. It's, uh, I'm going to be, uh, you know, uh, you either get the, the, you either get the, 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 the wedding speech or the dance. You don't get both. That's crazy. I've never seen your mom do both. Um, so make dua for everybody. Make dua for me. Allah protects me. All right, guys.